I am confident that it will have the support of every American. When Truman gave his first speech in 1947 that was carried live on television, he created the model for what presidents would do going forward. Television has changed politics by helping to bring presidents into people's homes. And as a result of that, it's changed what people look for in a president. Not just that they need to be warm and that they need to connect with people. That was something that Franklin Roosevelt was able to do with the radio. Join your neighbors in your own town to help serve your country. Yes. But they also had to be telegenic. They had to be entertaining in a different way. You know, I've been wondering why it is that these crowds have been so large. So television really does revolutionize the kinds of politicians who can become president. Putting politics and TV together humanized the presidency in this completely new way. You weren't just sort of knowing that you had a president in the White House, you were seeing him. The first televised presidential speech was by Harry Truman in October of 1947. No matter how long and hard the way, we cannot turn aside from that goal. The speech wasn't necessarily historic because of its content, but it was the first of a continuing series of speeches that Truman delivered on television, making it the expectation that when the president spoke to the country, he would do so on TV. This is Richard Harkness, NBC News, Washington, reporting. When you look at the arc of history and you look at politics, the people who were most successful were the people who could use TV and the media landscape the best. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. During the 1952 election, you see two dramatically different approaches to television. Eisenhower listened to the advice of his advisors on Madison Avenue and from Hollywood to incorporate short, catchy, personality-driven advertisements. You like Ike, I like Ike, everybody likes Ike on president. The difference between Stevenson and Eisenhower in 1952 is really this tension between seeing TV as this tool for education versus a vehicle for entertainment. Eisenhower answers America. Eisenhower had figures like Robert Montgomery, a Hollywood actor. He later became the first presidential television advisor. Robert Montgomery actually watched his first campaign speech uh, in Abilene, Kansas in 1952. We are, of course, experiencing today a Kansas shower. And the graphics for that were horrific. Eisenhower stood in the rain. The wind was blowing what few strands of his hair that he had. The visuals horrified Robert Montgomery. He called Eisenhower and begged him to take TV seriously because you're presenting an image of leadership through TV. Adelaide Stevenson really sees TV as this opportunity to educate people on his stands on particular issues. He purchased longer periods of time, but in order to afford that, they had to be later at night. And so he didn't have the audience that Eisenhower was able to tap into. First, I should like to express my gratitude to the radio and television networks. Eisenhower's campaign introduced many things that have become central to our modern political system. Personalities driving party politics and driving electoral campaigns. Figures like John F. Kennedy and later Richard Nixon adapt these same strategies. They expand it and deepen the connection between presidents and the entertainment and media industries. During the post-war period, the spotlight expands on the presidency because of television. There's an uptick in televised congressional hearings. One person that takes advantage of this is Richard Nixon. When he secures the vice presidential nomination in 1952, there are allegations of financial corruption and perhaps payoffs that he received from some supporters. I come before you tonight as a candidate for the vice presidency. To salvage his place on the ticket, he goes to TV and gives a half an hour address, laying bare his finances. And very famously, at the end of it, he has this memorable line where he talks about there was one gift from a supporter. It was a little Cocker Spaniel dog, and our little girl, Tricia, the six-year-old, named it Checkers. And you know, the kids, like all kids, love the dog. 
And I just want to say this right now, that regardless of what they say about it, we're going to keep it. And TV viewers responded very positively to this speech. They wrote letters to the Republican Party and encouraged Dwight Eisenhower to keep him on the ticket. Thank you very much. So it was a stunning success. During the 1960 election, it was actually John F. Kennedy who capitalized on the power of television. He was not a really well-known national figure. His father had been a studio executive during the 1920s, and so he uses his insight of the celebrity-making machine of Hollywood and applies it to the campaign trail. Uh, he floods the airwaves and newspapers with advertisements about an upcoming visit, and it was really this celebrity event. Let me say first that I accept the nomination of the Democratic Party. So this really demonstrates that new media affords opportunities for outside candidates to claim political authority by connecting directly to the public. John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon faced off in a series of four televised presidential debates. The first one is what really stands out in historical memory because John Kennedy came prepared to speak to television audiences, not necessarily to debate Richard Nixon, but to make his presentation of his personality and his policies to television viewers. The candidates need no introduction. The Republican candidate, Vice President Richard M. Nixon, and the Democratic candidate, Senator John F. Kennedy. Richard Nixon is very sweaty. He's got a five o'clock shadow and he's wearing a gray suit where he kind of blends into the, the background. Whereas John F. Kennedy is wearing a dark suit. He's looking directly at the camera in a really effective manner. Only you can decide what you want, what you want this country to be. Richard Nixon, on the other hand, wanted to just focus on the issues. This is not because he didn't think about the optics. He was very aware of the optics, but he thought that emphasizing his substance would be a way to assert his leadership credentials. It isn't a question of which government does the most. It's a question of which administration does the right thing. It's one of the really fascinating things about Richard Nixon and, and a misconception that people have that in 1960, he wasn't thinking about TV. He was. It really illuminates that this celebrity driven style that ultimately triumphs is not preordained. In fact, it was a really contested development. For almost four decades, politicians are thinking about their communication strategy and appealing to a national audience. We choose to go to the moon. Our long national nightmare is over. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Cable offers a completely different approach to television. If regular television brought presidents into people's homes, cable television required them to sing for their supper. It required them to be entertaining and to compete with many, many, many more options. Cable turns politics, which is already a sort of competition, personality-driven area of our society, into a hyper-competitive 24-hour cycle race. We're not only on cable television, but we're on the cyber universe as well. I think Teddy Roosevelt would like this very much. Cable becomes the center of U.S. politics in the 1990s. In 1996, you get the introduction of MSNBC and Fox News. MSNBC, news and information 24 hours a day. But you also get all of these other cable channels who are dipping their toes into politics. MTV is rocking the vote. Comedy Central has Bill Maher's Politically Incorrect and it's covering the conventions. Well, I, th facts, I think but, TV you know, killed radio, you know something. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Clinton, who is this young outsider candidate in the Democratic Party, shows up on MTV in order to talk about things like his policies and his underwear preferences. I was asked a question about my undergarments, more specifically whether I wore boxers or briefs. Candidates have much less control over their image than they did in an earlier eras. Having my picture taken with someone doesn't mean that you know, I'm, I'm a friend with them or know them very well. Uh, I've had my picture taken with you. <laughs>
Now, basically everything is fair game. I'm going to let all the political pundits in this town uh, have a long discussion about uh, what happened in the election. And in a way that makes it a lot harder for candidates because it means every moment that you are out in public, you could be in the middle of a new news story without even realizing it. Breaking news, everybody, from Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. The president taking a tumble off his bike earlier today. That's a lot of pressure. Presidents had to quickly adapt in the 21st century to a changing media landscape. Social media is invented and people want to see instantaneously what a president is thinking. Now you have someone like Barack Obama where he says, I want to be doing social media. He's doing things like Reddit and having pictures of himself taken, showing that he's really the one at the computer. And then you have former President Trump who comes on the scene and uses Twitter in this entirely new way where millions of people hour by hour know what the president is thinking in real time. There was an era in the U.S. when journalists were really dedicated to protecting the presidency as a powerful position and as a symbol of U.S. strength on the world stage. So, for instance, they wouldn't show Franklin Roosevelt using a wheelchair. They wouldn't report on John Kennedy's extramarital affairs. There were things that were considered kind of off limits. That begins to change with Watergate and the idea that there is a great deal of presidential corruption that's not being reported. The trial of the two remaining defendants in the Watergate case continued today in Washington. And so as the institution changes, as the media change, and as there's more skepticism about political institutions and government, that protection around the president erodes very quickly. Candidates operating in this communication and media landscape have to be very, very cautious while also trying to be authentic. It's a very hard balance. But it also creates new opportunities because there's so much stuff out there. I ran for president because I believe we're in a battle for the soul of this nation. I still believe that to be true. Thinking back to 1947 and that first televised speech, it was something that was so carefully crafted, something that was read off of a piece of paper and just a standard presidential speech in a lot of ways. The media landscape has transformed so much because of technology. That being said, at the core, you still have presidents who are trying to convince the American public to do something whether it's to back their policies, whether it's to vote for the person that they think they want to be elected in a certain state or city. Times we were told that we can't. And the people who pressed on with that American creed, yes, we can. Presidents at the end of the day are still appealing to Americans to do something. And that goes right back to what President Truman was doing. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.